Hey everybody, how's it going? Glenn Fricker here once again on location at Sweetwater, uh, hanging out with my very good friend Nick Bocott. And we were trading some war stories earlier. You know, uh, I worked with a lot of independent bands over the years and whatnot, and you got to work with Max Norman in the studio at one point. What yep. record was that? That was the last one, the Rocky to Hell. Okay, cool. But we're, we're talking about, you know, going into the studio and working and stuff like that and producers messing with it. But we thought we'd come back with a little bit something a little bit more fundamental to the home recording crowd. And that's uh, three mistakes you should avoid when, you know, playing in the studio. You know, th three things you should be aware of, three critical errors that will wind up costing you time and money when you walk into a studio and you don't know this stuff. I've, Nick, what, what, what's your biggest mistake you think you've ever made in the studio? The biggest mistake I've ever made is probably just turning up, but that <laughs> aside, I went in once and I didn't know the song as well as I thought, as on reflection I should have done, and I wrote the darn thing. And th I've seen that happen numerous times, you know, I mean, like, band will come in and, you know, it's like everybody's all set up, ready to go, and then just nothing. Yeah. And it's like, well, didn't you practice? Well, I thought I did. Well, apparently you didn't practice enough. So that, that's the thing I'd say is, you know, you can never practice too much. Yeah, and, and also practicing as a band is really important because mm -hmm. you're all going to play. I personally prefer it when you can play as much live together as possible. That's right. how the first couple of records were done. The initial guitar, bass, and drums were all recorded as one. Right. Then overdubs were done afterwards. It wasn't separate things. Right. So you have to know it as a band, because if one guy doesn't know it, the whole thing goes off the rails really quickly. So even though you wrote it, know your darn material before you pay someone to record it. A big one for me is uh, guitar setups in terms of intonation and whatnot, especially if you've got a guitar with a Floyd Rose system on it. I've seen this happen, I don't know how many times, you know, the guitar player will come in, you know, his strings are dead. He's like, oh, I bought some new strings, you know, goes to put them on and they're a different gauge. Yeah. And then the Floyd does this, you know, and you, you spend the next hour trying to get the thing readjusted. You're, you're taking the back off, you're adjusting screws and whatnot. All the while, this is costing you time in the studio uh, for, for time you could have spent the night before changing your strings out. And that, that's the big thing is, you know, if you're going to put new strings on your guitar, do it before you come into the studio. And don't put them on a month beforehand. Put them on the day beforehand or maybe two days beforehand. Get them stretched out, get them a little bit broken in, but don't kill them dead. Yeah. And if you've got a Floyd system, make sure you get the same gauge of strings, not something else, otherwise you're gonna run into problems. And ultimately, once you do have your new strings on, make sure the guitar is intonated so it makes chords all up and down the neck properly instead of you know sounding great down at one end and just being all over the place the next time. And if you are taking your guitar to be set up by a professional, make sure you tell that person what you're tuning your guitar too, because otherwise they're just going to intonate it for E standard. And if you're turning down to a, an open C or something like that, you're also going to run into problems. And that's more sp studio time you're going to waste fixing something. And along those lines, my number two would be do the same exact thing with your pedals, your cables, and your amplifiers. Mm -hmm. Don't go into the studio with no batteries and a dead battery and your favorite pedal, like your HM2, mm -hmm. or not having a wall walk for your mauler. You need to power this thing up, make right. sure the cables are crackle free and work. Oh, that's a big one too. And amps, make sure there's no crackly pots and or bad tubes if you're using a tube amp. Sure. Like preparation is the key and you need to go in prepped. And that includes warming up before you start recording. If you're paying someone to record you, every minute is costing you dollars. So if you're starting recording at nine, get up at seven and play for two hours. That way when you, when you walk in, you're ready to hit the ground running. That's actually a great idea. Yeah, good luck getting a musician out of bed at seven in the morning though. <laughs> well, if they're smart, they won't have gone to bed from the night before, which will be fine. Okay. So yeah, just Fair stay enough. up for an extra two hours and go straight to the studio, you'll be fine. My number two, again, this kind of goes back on the whole guitar setup thing is, um, Make sure your electronics are in, in good working condition. Uh, taking a little keg deoxid to your volume pots can clear out any scratchiness. Uh, that can be a big thing. I mean, like the worst offender I saw was a guy who brought a guitar. It's a complete piece of crap, and um, he insisted on using it. And I'm gonna, that's going to kind of go in with my third piece. We, we were wondering, why does this guitar sound so terrible and whatnot? And he had literally, we took the back cav cavity cover off and he literally twisted together all the connections and then just taped them. <laughs> he didn't use any solder. Not at all. So there weren't any actual proper electrical connections made. You know, I remember me and my buddy just scratching. What are we supposed to do here? So, you know, we fixed all the wiring and everything hooked up. Next day, the kid comes in and goes, wow, this guitar sounds so much better. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. I wonder why. It's a mystery. Talking about, this is not my number three, but a great story like that was a band I was 
producing back in England, I said, look, you go and get your amp serviced. Mm. You know, when was the last time the tubes were changed? You had an old Marshall 50. And, and of course, I said, you can do that. Yeah, well, really, tubes? What are those? <laughs> anyway, so he does the deed. He goes to a local guy, gets it done. Amp sounds great. But halfway through the session, we're like, what is that smell? It's actually, actually not a horrible smell. It's actually kind of making us hungry. Everyone's going, did someone leave something in here? We eventually go, to, it's in the back of his amp. The guy who fixed it left a sandwich against the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ham and cheese sandwich. Oh, so that's it was amazing. toasting. It was toasting as he was playing. That's and great. And it wow. smelt great. But anyway, um, <laughs> not recommended, by the way. The but Marshall ham and cheese. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Cheaper than having a toaster. Just slap it in the back by the power tubes. Okay. You'll be fine. <laughs> wow. My number three with the modern day recording crowd is trust these. Mm. Not these when it comes to, is this a good take? Mm -hmm. I've recorded so many people on the newfangled stuff where you can see what you've recorded and everyone's fixated on the grid. Am I in time with the grid? Who cares? It either sounds good. Well, if it sounds good, do it again. It should sound great. You mm. should be delighted with, not that'll do. If you walk out of a studio going, that was okay, you failed miserably. You have to walk out going, that was the best we could have done. So trust your ears. Don't look at the grid and go, well, we could do that better because we're actually, we speed up towards the end. Who cares? Most of the great bands ebb and flow. In fact, if you tried to grid some of John Bonham's brilliance, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be as brilliant as it was. Right, exactly, because, because you just lose feel. what made him John Bonham. It was feel, feel, feel. So trust your ears, close your eyes. Don't look at that darn grid. Mm -hmm. Trust these and go, it either rocks or it doesn't. And I've heard stuff that's gridded perfectly and it doesn't rock at all it's uh, yeah boring. And, yeah well I was gonna say yeah perfect is the, is the uh, antithesis of interesting yeah so and and I've, I've said this numerous times I think I think music really began to suffer when we stopped listening to it and we started looking at it and thinking oh well if we put it on the grid it's gonna make it good that's just not how it works M great music comes from interaction with other artists and whatnot and that brings me back on my point number three and that kind of goes in with point number two and that is B easy to work with. Nobody likes somebody who's difficult and chances are if you're difficult in the studio and you make everybody life's, everybody's life hell, nobody's going to want to work with you again. So there is that as well. A, a little bit of, I understand artistic vision, but there is give and take. A little bit of moderation goes a long way. Um, back on the subject of that guitar that had the stuff twisted together, the reason we were doing that is because the guitar player insisted after I told him, look, we've got a bunch of great guitars in here you can play. I'm playing this or I'm not playing anything. And I, this was early in my career. These days it would have been like, okay, well, there's the door. Have fun. Yeah. Right. But I mean, like, this is, I was still trying to get, get some projects out the door. So I'm like, okay. So, you know, through the hoops, I jump. And it's just like, if the guy had been the slightest bit mature and realized, okay, this is holding the whole session back and this is costing everybody money, he probably would have said something along the lines. You know what? You got a point there. Let's, let's pick some, something else up. I mean, like Excalibur syndrome is real and it's <laughs> dumb. I mean, like, it, that's the thing. It's like, look, I understand that that's your one special guitar that has been anointed to you and you're going to make rock history with it. Yes, we're all very, very impressed with that, by the way. However, you know, something else that maybe does the job a little bit better is probably perfectly adequate for your magnum opus that you're going to unleash on the world that's going to impress your mom and your dad. So just to chime in on what Glenn just said, um, I always tell people, if you're looking at two drummers, one is brilliant, but his name is Richard Head, literally. The guy is a d Don't work with him, because he will drag you down. Mm -hmm. If there's another guy who's not as good, but is a sweetheart and you love being with him, you will play better, you will grow together better, mm -hmm. you will become a real band. That's why supergroups rarely work, because they right. get this clash of egos, the clash of the titans, and everything goes dead. But one, one or two albums and it's done, and they right. never talk to each other again. The real bands, the great bands with longevity, mm. they actually like each other. What a concept. So have fun with music. It's supposed to be fun. It's a three-letter word, F-U-N. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that exactly. Yeah, remember, you know what? We are ultimately supposed to be doing something we enjoy. So try and enjoy yourself along the way, but just use your brain along while you're at it. That way you can avoid costing yourself money that you don't need to waste. Anyway, uh, one more thing if you're wondering what's back here. This is my new pedal with Rev. This is the Northern Mauler. It's crossed between modern distortion and the classic Swedish chainsaw. And this is on sale right now at Sweetwater. We've got some links in the description below for all the details. And if you want to know any more about it, contact your Sweetwater sales engineer.